And now, without further ado, it is my pleasure. Please welcome our speakers. Yay. That's us. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm Jeff Moss. I'm going to try to moderate this crowd, which is never an easy task. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> I'm, uh, well, we're all commissioners with the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace, or the GCSC, and it's a three year endeavor um, to try to think about and formulate some norms. Um, commissions like this have happened in the past. Um, we like to think that we're a little different. Uh, we have a research component that we try to actually use uh, research to inform some of our norms. Uh, we're about, what, year two, middle of year two, one and a half, year two. So we're really starting to digest a lot of the thinking and feedback we've gotten. Uh, we've already proposed some norms. You might have read the one about uh, the call to protect the core of the internet. And we're about to uh, release another uh, couple of norms. So that's not entirely what we want to talk about here. What I want to talk about is sort of this interface between policy and technology and some of the problems we're facing. So um, my first kind of question to everybody here is just kind of give us a, a, your thoughts about this commission, commissions in general, why you're participating, and what you hope to get out of, uh, what you hope to see the work product of, a, of our commission, how it will help people in the room. Anybody want to go? Jim? This is an outgrowth of uh, uh, something that started in the UK about seven years ago, where uh, a bunch of people, mainly British and American, got together and said, y you know, we got to figure out how to make the, the interstate politics work. We've got to figure out what the rules of the road are. This led to this thing called the Hague process, which has now become like a, a gathering of the clans. The last one was in Delhi. And it's like everyone and their dog. And so they keep adding things like the children's crusade for cybersecurity. And uh, so it's, but one of the spin-offs was when the Dutch did it, they said, we need to make these things more concrete. So they've created this uh, global Center for Cybersecurity Excellence. They've created a thing to push this thing called the Talon Manual, which is on the law of war. And they've created this global commission. And the idea is governments are going a little slow. Maybe we can help them out. Yeah, and I put, I put in, in some context because, you know, I used to be at the State Department doing this cyber diplomacy, whatever the hell that means, and I'll talk that about that. That was a work release. <laughs> yeah, one work Here's release, work release. Uh, and, and the idea is that, you know, it, it, yeah, the Dutch started this commission, but the idea of the commission was really to help supplement what was trying to go on among governments. And governments were looking at what, how do you make cyberspace more stable in the long term? So there are a lot of things governments and other people do to try to respond to threats, for instance. There's a lot of technical things about hardening the targets. There's offensive and defensive and all kinds of ranges of other things. But the idea is in the long term, how do you try to make cyberspace more stable by coming up with some voluntary rules of the road as part of it? That's the norms part. Part of it is uh, international law applies in cyberspace. Part of it is confidence building measures, you know, just transparency measures. So how do you come up with a framework that in the long term means that states uh, don't ha have an incentive to keep things working well for everyone, for the technical community, for, for governments, for citizens, and not have an incentive to disrupt them? How do, how do we get to that stage? And so this commission was set up because usually that's a discussion among governments alone. I participated in those discussions, and Jim did as well, uh, when they were among governments in the UN system and others. But there really wasn't a multi-stakeholder, as we call it, way to look at these issues. And that's what the commission is trying to do, not compete with governments, but help inform that conversation. The commission has folks who are technical experts, who are policy experts from all over the world. And the idea is, and my expectation and hope is, we're going to be able to really uh, contribute to that debate uh, and really bring some of these communities together, particularly the technical community, the policy community, and others, so that we can focus on these issues. Because with all the focus on all the things that are happening every day, some of these long-term issues and what the rules of the road are and what expectations are really are going to be important. So Chris and Jim talked about the obvious, um, not the obvious. <laughs> it, it was deep, subtle, and inspired. Um, how many of you have heard of the term sustainable development? Yeah, let's all raise our hands, okay. Let's just all raise our hands. How many of you have heard the phrase strategic arms uh, reduction? Right, Dr. Wigan, please, thank you. How many of you have heard of conflict prevention and the duty to protect? All of those phrases grew out of commissions, all of them. 
They were short-term, high-level, widely-ranging, big-idea enterprises that brought together the best minds to think about the biggest problems. Needless to say. Where did we go? <laughs> Maybe this doesn't fall in that category. But that is one of the aspirations of the commission. And the stability of cyberspace is a big phrase. I mean, what do we mean by stability? What do we mean about, about cyberspace? And, you know, I'm, I'm an operator. All this B3, blah, 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 is interesting. But what does it mean we do? And the second thing this commission is really, I think, doing in the course of its work is teaching governments how to work effectively with non-governmental actors. Now, multi-stakeholder model, working with the private sector, working with academics, clergy, uh, industry, is common course for mayors and for people at the state and local level around the world, provincial level around the world. It is not the common course for national level governments for most of them, and it is certainly not the common course when gov governments get together internationally. So one of the contributions this commission is making in a field that demands it is helping governments learn how to work productively with non-governmental actors. So um, one of the things I always find interesting is that if you have norms, people always say, well, people can violate the norm. It's not a quote unquote hard norm. How do you enforce the norm? And a lot of times it's just important to figure out uh, who's out of line, right? Who's violating a norm? Well, if the same actor keeps violating the norm over and over, maybe you pay more attention to that actor. But if it's every once in a while, um, so it helps you keep a scorecard of maybe who the people are that are acting in good faith versus those that aren't. And so there's a lot of uses of norms um, that aren't, uh, there's not one particular goal. Norms serve many purposes. Um, and I bet a lot of us in this room, we already follow norms that you probably don't even think about. They're sort of internalized, right? You think about uh, acceptable use policies. They're sort of contractual. But how many people actually follow the letter of their acceptable use policy, right? It's kind of a guideline more than a contract, right? Peering agreements. Uh, other things that keep the internet working, they're essentially norms. And it's all kind of negotiable. But right, don't we talk about ISPs or transit providers? If they misbehave enough times, we know they're violating the norms and we avoid them or we penalize them somehow. So what we're doing is essentially uh, that at more of a policy level. And that's something I find really fascinating I want to ask the, the, the panel about is this interface between tech and policy. Um, because I came from the tech side and I got more involved in the policy side. And there's, there's a class of cultures there, right? The, the different words, you do things at different speeds. And I see a lot of tech people want to get involved in policy and they run in there and they shoot off their 10 ideas. They get very little uh, uh, accomplished. They get burned out and then they leave. And I think that's because they don't know how to necessarily engage in, in the policy world. Um, you know, it moves, some of these things move at decades, speed. You know, people say, why are you involved in the GCSE? What's the rush? Yeah, nothing's going to happen. It's like, well, I deal day to day on small problems and I'm doing stuff that will take years, maybe decades. And so how do you reconcile, right, that need uh, to involve tech people and... So let's talk a little bit about, about the role that norms play in our everyday lives, given that this is such a norm observant group, by definition. <laughs> um, but norms really, I think they play two powerful roles. One is they, they, they condition our performance in any given moment. You know, there's a bandwidth of acceptable behavior that we will perform. And the second thing that norms do is create prospects for the rest of us. It gives us some level of expectation of where you will fall. There are norms of expected behavior. So the commission has come out uh, originally now, now with two norms that it has published. One, as Jeff mentioned, on, the, on protecting the core, the public core of the internet. And the second norm, it may not surprise you, is about non-interference with technical means in elections and referenda and plebiscites that happen around the world. Now you might say, you know, seriously? I mean, you know, sort of, you know, put your wand away, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but if we don't, if we don't speak these norms, if we don't narrate what the expectation of performance is, we can't complain when people don't comply. 
And so the, the, the normative exercise that we're going through now is not so much the articulation of, of a brand new and exciting and unimagined world. It's a consolidation of reasonable expectations around how we should treat each other in this thing we call cyberspace. So, and, and the way that's built, so it's, I agree with Jane completely, uh, surprisingly. It's a first. <laughs> no, uh, but, <laughs> but panel's over. <laughs> yeah. But they're, they're really expectations for behavior. You don't expect people to follow them right away. You have to get global acceptance of these. Because people, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people say cyberspace is a rule-free zone or is a wild, wild west, whatever hell term you want to use. And it's not true. There are things that apply to it already. There are common practices. There are common practices for states, too. But at the same time, we need to articulate what are these where are these you know, rules of the road that people can then adhere to and what are expectations of other states? And then when states break those expectations, when they do bad things, it's not just calling them out, which they've done, we've been better at calling them out, but you, know, you can't really name and shame some of these countries just by right. calling them out. So you have to have consequences for that. But I want to go to, to Jeff's point of the, the, uh, the issues of trying to deal, bridge the gap between the policy community and the technical community. And there's lots of different divisions in this space. So even within the policy community, the economic people don't really talk to the security people really well. So there's that division. And then there's this division between the, um, you know, the technical community and the policy community who don't speak the same language. And this was made clear to me. One of the norms that Jane mentioned was this one, don't, you know, don't essentially futz with the uh, public core of the Internet. Don't, don't do something that would undermine it in a large scale. Uh, and that seems reasonable. And then there was one that came out of this UN process. Uh, don't, states should not attack the certs, the C certs uh, of another country, because they're seen, in a sense, as the ambulances. They're the response teams. And they should use them for good, for defensive purposes, not bad. So a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago, I was keynoting the first conference, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams that was having its meeting in Malaysia. And I talked about these, particularly the one dealing with certs. And there were you know, several hundred people in the audience. They'd never heard of this before. And this is the audience this is really aimed at. So, if they're not knowing about it, if they're not taking that work forward and actually going to various venues and say, this is a good idea, we need to bring this forward, that's a real problem. That's a real disconnect, and we really need to bridge that gap as much as possible. So this all started in 1998 when the Russians proposed uh, an international treaty in the UN that would govern cyberspace, and they were particularly concerned with the risk that this new technology would give the US a military advantage that it would use. And, the treaty was premature, of course. It received very little support. But a bunch of us started thinking, you know, ultimately we're going to need some kind of convention, some kind of formal agreement among states. But people are not ready to do that. And so how do you build a pathway to get to trust, to get to agreement? And that pathway that a few of us identified and has come up in these three rounds of UN negotiations was uh, norms, which are expectations about state behavior, confidence building measures, like I'm going to tell you what I'm doing so you don't freak out, and then capacity building, which is making other countries able to defend themselves. And that kind of, that was 2010, and that was the agenda. And there's two problems that sort of touch on what we're talking about here and sort of explain the commission. The first is we probably have all the norms we already need, right? We, there might be some places we're missing, but we don't, we don't need any more norms. And so you've got a cottage industry in universities of cranking out. You know, on alternate Wednesdays, Wednesdays, people agree not to attack certs or something. We've reached the end of this path. And in some ways, instead of building trust, um, there's much more distrust than there was in, in 2010. It's going to be hard to get agreement. Second part was this is a really complicated problem, and I bear a little of the responsibility for this because I, I basically copied a lot of old Cold War arms agreements, like the Conventional Forces in Europe Agreement, if you want to raise your hand again, <laughs> or the Helsinki Agreement. These are models that we use to deal with conflicting states, and it's not just a state problem. That gets us back to this issue of who else is involved, who else has a stake. Now, I completely reject the idea that corporations have the same power as states. Only the, the people, only people who say that are people who've never had to deal with a state when it's in a bad mood, right? Um, our opponents will kill. But they will also, they're afraid, they want to come to a deal. So the first problem is how do we involve this broader community? And there really aren't good models for that. Yeah. 
The second problem is this touches, when it was arms control, it was relatively easy. Arms control, when I used to do arms control, like here's a tank, there's a tank. I got a tank, you got a tank. This, this touches everything. It touches economics, it touches politics, it touches society. And so when states see this, they see high levels of distrust, uh, no good models for how to deal with it, a big community of their citizens who want to be involved, and the fact that it, it doesn't really fit, the, mm. it touches on so many things, they become cautious. And that means they move slowly. Well, and, and, and this is such an undeveloped area that a lot of states at a really high level, you know, the people who are in the trenches get this, but the people at the high level, the decision makers, the presidents, prime ministers, others, they're beginning to understand these issues, but, but it's still well, seen as a technical. I'm just happy we're not following uh, mutually assured destruction models. We, I mean, we are, we are, I unfortunately. Mean, so. I mean, people seem to go to the models they like. If, if we use, I don't know, Clausewitz again, or an OODA loop, it's like, you know, people fall back on the constructs they're familiar with, and so maybe in the early days it was arms control. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. okay, sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Those, those I think as the gone. only former soldier on this panel, <laughs> I feel compelled to speak up. Okay. You're, you're exactly right. I mean, the, the danger is we go to what we know, right? And so there, there is an awful lot of knowledge and practice around security, norms of behavior between governments. It is not the right model, in my view, to just simply take all of that and import it into this area. The other, the other model that we have that, that I'm a sort of unapologetic advocate for is thinking more along the lines of public health. You know, why can't we insist on basic hygiene in cyberspace, basic defenses that we know prevent or rapidly mitigate uh, the problems that we know about, and, and those exist. You know, I'm a, a board of, a, on the board of directors of the Center for Internet Security, so is, so is Chris, um, and, and Jim had a, had a key role to play in creating the top critical controls, you know them as the top 20. You know, Etsy has its own, and the Australians have their own. Why can't we insist that people, in effect, wash their hands before they get online? Why is that such a bridge too far? Back to Jim's point, because people don't think we can impose expectations on industry or companies or enterprises, and that's just wrong. Well, we have, we have two trends, and they unfortunately run into each other. The one trend is the resurgence of nationalism and authoritarian regimes who really don't want to play by the rules. The second trend is the Internet's had a political effect, and it's changed the grounds for legitimacy. So it used to be, I, when I was, worked in the government, I had a joke with my wife that what they don't know won't hurt them. She says, I can't say that anymore. <laughs> but to get people to support something, now don't scream, you need a different approach. It can't be so much top down, it can't be multiple layers, it's got to be flatter. There have to be avenues for the citizens to contribute directly. A guy who's sort of good at this, and you may not like him, but he's an effective politician, is someone named Trump. He's discovered how to make that connection. And we're struggling with that. I think all democracies are struggling with citizens now want to be more involved. How do we do that? Yeah, although I'd say this is not exactly a priority for him, uh, this area. But, well, but we, we have a, <laughs> a monthly quota on Trump jokes, and unfortunately we've exceeded it already, so I'm into it. But, but, you know, I think the other issue is I was going to the maturity model, and I agree with Jane in sort of the hygiene issue, which is one part of this, but there's also what are states, when you talk about norms especially, it is what are states willing to constrain themselves? What are they willing to give up uh, and decide they're not doing? So one that came out was don't, states should not attack the critical infrastructure of another state absent wartime. If it's wartime, there are rules about proportion and distinctionality and all these things for the law of armed conflict, humanitarian law. But, but absent that, you know, what do states constrain themselves to do? And this is such a new area, and there's so little comfort in this that states are not really willing to constrain themselves a lot. However, they have made some strides in doing that, and then we see them actually exceeding those agreements uh, all the time. And then the question is, how do you make sure that you reinforce that those are real important expectations and there are consequences for breaking them? And the other norm that's in there is one, this has been true for a long time, you as a government are responsible for actions taken from your territory. So if there's a pirate base in San Francisco, the U.S. government has the obligation to other states to close down that pirate base. And in the West, what you can call the West, in countries that have rule of law, you know, they'll go after hackers, but there are many countries where they either don't have the capability 
mm -hmm. or they don't have the desire, or they're actually sponsoring them. Yeah. You know? And so it makes it a much more complex environment to say, here's a norm. And it's like, that's really interesting. Come back to me in a year. So we've got, um, I've got two other questions I want to explore. We've got about half our time left. Um, one is then, how would you suggest to pay people that are more technical than policy, how do you suggest they get involved? Or is it, uh, you know, at what point are there too many cooks in the kitchen? Um, when I was at ICANN and people would ask me this, I, I had limited options. I mean, there's requests for comments all the time at IETF, you know, ICANN, and it's, people would say, well, I don't want to put a comment on a web form. It's, I, I agree with that, but on the other hand, at ICANN, we tracked all those comments and there was one person that never showed up to any meeting. Nobody knew who they were. They commented on every single proposal for like the last decade. I mean, this person was legendary. And so when we read that person's comments, they like counted for like 10 of other people's comments. Because they understood the process, they'd been involved for a long time, they'd considered multiple viewpoints, and so that was like getting almost a white paper in that one person's comments. So um, they never had to spend a nickel to travel to any meetings or anything. And so I think our venue, our avenues for participation are more be, are, are different in the technical community, but it, you could see with the NTIA comments or through the, um, who was it, the Department of Commerce and their comments on the uh, arms control versus uh, exploits, what was the? Oh, the, uh, the uh, Wassenaar. Wassenaar comments, right? Oh. Record number of comments, more than they'd ever had <laughs> from the technical community. So I think, you know, we're desperate to participate, but we don't maybe have the ways to. I mean, what, what yeah. do you think? I, I, Go ahead. Just, I, I was the person who negotiated the Wassenaar agreement, and there's a, a like so many of these things, a, a part of it that is in public where it was successful, and the rest of it, some days I wonder if it was such a good idea. But. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think one of the things is we need to do a better job, and this is one of the reasons we're trying to have sessions like this. You know, as part of it is actually you know the governments and also us as the commission need to actually take some of the the, the momentum and go in and engage with groups like this and try to ask for them. It's not really reasonable to ask for people just to come and give right. all these comments because that's not going to happen. Because a lot of you know this is going borne out by my talk at the first conference. People don't even know what the hell's happening. So how can they have a conversation about this? How can they actually contribute to this process if we've been so bad about actually engaging these communities on things that are core to them and talking to them about it? So I think, we need, I think part of it is us. So, so I, I think there's a pretty fundamental um, challenge that's out there for all of us, right? When I, when I talk about this and I explain cybersecurity to non-technical executives, of which I am one, I say, look, you know, people say it's real complex. It's real simple. There are three problems we have not solved. Problem number one, how do we architect systems we can trust from components we can't? Problem number two, how do we safeguard the security of our, and the integrity of our information and identity in an open internet? Problem number three, what should the role of government be? Now this is a problem because when it comes to security, governments are used to being not only the big players, governments are used to being the monopolists in cyberspace, or in, in, in security space. And they are in physical space and they are not in cyberspace. And so there is really still a tug of war among co all the competing stakeholders on who should set the rules. And so when, if, if a community like this is thinking about getting involved, I mean the government, the, the way, you know, the fastest pathway, it's not very fast, is to come into government and learn how government works and learn the problems that governments are prioritizing. Um, and, and there's a shortage of skills that exist in this room in government. What we're trying to do as part of the commission's work is expand and relax government's mind a little bit that you don't have to have all the expertise existing within you know, the federal workforce or, or in the military, that there's an enormous capability out there that we have not even begun to tap into systematically. There's a generally shared sense that there's a strong disconnect between the policy community and the technology community. My own sense is there's there's solutions to some of our problems that are kind of rippling below the surface, but there's no way for either side to discover them, and part of it is this disconnect. The problem gets more complex when you throw in, you start throwing in the, the changes that are coming along, and so we were talking about don't scream AI beforehand, and you know, it's just, okay, so it's just another program, I mean, who cares? But, but the level of understanding um, how do you get people to write rules when they don't understand the technology, right? right? 
Uh, that's, it's better than it used to be. One of the things I do is when I go to a congressional office, I see whether the member has a yellow legal pad on their desk. That's generally a sign they're still not using the internet. <laughs> and the number has gone down. But the level of how do, you, how do you get people to make rules for a community they don't understand or for devices they so, don't understand? So that, that's an argument for greater presence. But when you think about it, from when we were at Homeland Security, we took on the challenge of how do we increase the ranks of qualified cybersecurity personnel working in DHS across the board. Jeff was involved. And, and we figured out we had to do five things well. One, we need to hire, test, and train to standards. I mean, can people do stuff or not? It's one thing to talk about a good game. It's another thing to be able to do it. You know, I fly a lot. I am not a pilot. Okay, there's a difference, and you guys understand that. Number two is how do we open up genuinely the pipeline between academia, industry, and government in a way that allows a more free flow of talent across the board? How do we, how do we revise all of our procurement guidelines? How do we successfully manage this group of folks once you're in government? Not a trivial challenge. And then how do we swarm? on problems when they're big ones because they lie beyond the capacity of any single agency to handle. I mean, these are practical, wor real world problems that, that government agencies have to cope with in thinking about bringing on board talent. Well, there is also this trend. I mean, when I had the office in the State Department, we were the first one anywhere in the world, and there's like 26 now countries that have them. I had a lot of policy people. I also had some really strong technical people who were there to help inform yeah. us. As, we don't, and as Jane said, you don't have to be a pilot to fly in a plane. You don't, have to be a po you don't have to be a technical in expert to understand yeah. some of the policy dimensions of this, and I think that's why this has always been treated more as a boutique, shiny object issue by senior decision makers, because they think, oh, cyber, that's really complex, I don't get that. But having that, those people there to draw on, I think, is really important. So I want to move us into sort of our final topic, and then if we have time, we'll do some questions, be great. Um, which is a uh, consequence side of this. Right? So what, what are your options realistically if you do see people violating norms? Maybe talk about certain norms and the consequences and then how that might or may not apply into in cyber. I mean, so, I mean, let me start on that because I think it's important, as I said before, if there are no consequences, if there are no costs for your actions at all, then that is essentially creating a norm of inaction and saying that this is acceptable conduct. If you can, for instance, manipulate a country's elections and there's no consequences, no costs that are meaningful, and they have to be relatively timely, there's issues around attribution, et cetera, on timely, they have to be timely, and they actually have to change the decision maker's calculus so they don't do it again. And we've been really terrible about that. We're trying to get better. We've been better at calling out countries, great, but you're not going to name and shame Russia. You're not going to name and shame North Korea. So you actually have to tailor this. There are issues around escalation because this is a new area. This is going to escalate out of control. You're not just going to use cyber tools. People think there's a cyber button you press and you, add, and you go right. against it, and that's just not true. But you're going to use economic Well, then tools, and people get really economic, wrapped up yeah, when, the United, wand, right? when the United States said, we reserve our full set of tools yeah. to respond to a cyber, all of a sudden everybody says, you're going to drop a bomb on me because no. I sent you a ping. And you're not going to do that. You're not going to send kinetic weapons uh, for most of these cyber attacks because we're not at the level of war. I mean, we're below that. They're still serious, uh, whether it's theft of information or things like NotPetya. But we've got to take action, and we've got to... Uh, the other thing I'd say is collective action is important, building alliances with other countries, and actually talking again to the technical community to say, are there other tools, are there other things we can be doing that are beyond the tool set that we normally think of, diplomatic, economic, kinetic, cyber? But, are there but other there, is a, there is a consensus now in the intelligence community and in the military that unless we impose damaging consequences on uh, the people who are attacking us, and as you guys probably know, and certainly Cyber Command knows, we are attacked every day by one of the four dwarfs, right? Uh, and the feeling is that sending them a nasty note or right. naming them in public or, worded or another <laughs> sanctions, I mean, how many, there's no sanctions left that we can impose on Russia, right? We, well, have to, we have to go, we disagree, because I'm in the camp that says we need to shoot back, and we need to think about how to manage that in a way that doesn't um, risk turning into a bigger conflict, but at the same time, we don't. it's a game of chicken, and right now the other guys are winning because we chicken out. So there's a consensus, I'd say, up to the three-star level that the U.S. needs to think about how to retaliate forcefully. I mean, I but it really depends. The mantra, let me just say the mantra real quick, it was... Um, Temporary 
painful and reversible. And reversible, and that's yeah. the key thing. And that's and so, how you hold them accountable. You right? know. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, I, you know, look, it wanna depends on what you're... Want to give me the leash? <laughs> it depends on your theory of the case, right? If your theory of the case is the only reason people conform to reasonable norms is because there's a fear of punishment, then we should all go home. I mean, there's a, there's a lot more motivating us in, in terms of compliant behavior. I, I, I think, you know, you do, you reach the limit case where, you know, shooting back is the only option. Every single society on the planet has rules for that. Um, but it's not just sort of fly your own flag and, no. you know, shoot at will. And, and even stand your ground laws, which we've seen play out in the physical world here, you know, people have been beginning to use that language in this domain, and it just feels inept. Look, there have been consequences around the world for politicians failing to understand the very powerful social norms that have emerged over the past 50 years. The norms of inclusivity, transparency, reciprocity, and accountability. What, what does that mean? Inclusivity. Nothing about me without me. How many politicians now are facing the consequences of failing to get that right? And not just in the United States, across the world. You know, publics are angry. And they're angry because people are, it seems like our institutions and our political class are unresponsive to the changes that have gone on, largely brought about by the internet and connectivity, knowledge, information, and community that's emerging. So ever, I mean, can we imagine a moment in time where we need norms more? I can't. Well, but I, to counter that, I'd say the Obama administration knew by April of 2016 what the Russians were up to. By August of 2016, they developed a package of overt and covert responses, and they didn't pull the trigger. And that's why we're in the mess we're in today. And, so and I, I, my no, no, advice but, but, is I mean, I'm talking the about like, whoa, whoa, whoa. responses to norms. I, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, not, not necessarily government norms. What we're proposing aren't, aren't sanctioned by a particular government. What we're saying is, here's some rules of the road for everybody. Right. Right. But what, what do we do if I in the United States see, I don't know, some other country violating or another company, right? What are my options? I guess I could name and shame. I could get on a mailing list. I could get online and say, hey, look, it's the fifth time that this behavior has happened. Or, boy, we seem to be getting a lot of attacks from Iran lately. I mean, really, what, what are our options short of picking up the phone and calling and the State Department? And this requires, I think, a lot more thought and, and I think a, a not a slavish, and Jim didn't suggest this, adherence to sort of military analogies where, you know, they have that spectrum of escalation, this straight line. I mean, wars don't happen in straight line. Every fist fight does not hold the potential for a nuclear exchange. I mean, there are important disruptions along the way, and there are other tools that can be brought to bear. When trouble happens, it's almost never a point problem. It's this, this toxic cocktail of, of things that come together in a way that, that have opened up points of influence. And so, you know, should we put fight back? Yeah, I, th I think we should. Do we know, do we have any common understanding? Do we have any coherent understanding of the conditions under which that's the right response? Not yet. Yeah, and I, I do think, I agree that we have to use all the tools in our tool set. We have to use them in the right way and the most effective tools that we have. Uh, and so we haven't done that. And I'd be the first, I mean, I, not the first, but I would also agree that we didn't do enough in the Obama administration to put back. I mean, that's not, that's absolutely right. And there are a lot of reasons, I think, not good reasons flash. for not doing it. Because there should have been a lot more action and that sends a message. But then to your point, Jeff, I mean, if you're a private entity and you're seeing this, you know, I think there are some things you can do. Some of the public attribution a lot of companies have done, mm -hmm. I think that's actually been helpful. Right? Sort of the APT1 report well, style? When, like, for instance, when we, you know, I negotiated the agreement with the Chinese on the theft of intellectual property, I think that, you know, when, they, when the report came out uh, on the Chinese, that, that helped actually, you. It, even though the Chinese were convinced that it was us that did it, we, which we didn't, uh, that actually kind of helped because it got it out in the public domain and people were discussing it. And I think it helped push Did it you along. Just make so. news? And, and <laughs> you, you guys probably know this, but. The FBI really only looks at people reactively. I mean, there has to have been a crime or an imputation of crime or something, and then they can go and look. NSA has broader authorities, but they're focused on a very narrow target set, right? And so there's a huge amount that doesn't get picked up by the federal government, and frankly, we wouldn't want them to pick it up. So the question is, if folks out there are seeing things, and if they have ideas on how to reverse it, yeah. how do we create a pipeline for that. And that's the last thing I wanted to say is that we're stuck with the tools that we have. And some of them we haven't really used as not enough or we don't understand or we don't have the okay. full capability, but they're traditional tools. One area I think of work with you guys is saying, are there things that we haven't thought of? 
Should we think about black holing traffic from a country? For, I mean, that, that has a lot of economic consequences beyond, you know, in, in, including on the country that's imposing it. But are there things that we can do that really we haven't thought about, the government hasn't thought about, that would help us improve this tool set so we can hold people accountable in a reversible way that's like painful but reversible? I, I think the other thing to um, keep in mind is that there are, for too long, government has treated problems in cyberspace as a matter for the intelligence community and something that needs to be compartmentalized <laughs> and kept aside uh, as if really the only important and valuable information were in that community. I mean, there are a couple of pathologies in, in our approach to intelligence that we really haven't yet overcome. One of them is, you know, the harder a piece of information is to get, the more important it must be. Well, you know, we had a pushcart dealer in Times Square warn us about a, a, a guy who was trying to bomb New York City. You know, another pathology is the higher up the source of information, the more authoritative it must be. Seriously? Do we still believe that? I mean, so, so we have a lot of, we, have, we, we need a lot more rigor in our thinking to, ve to develop responsible policies for the kinds of things Jim's talking about. And, and this connects back to our initial discussion, which is norms are rules of behavior. People are going to violate them until they decide there's a penalty to doing that. And then we have to figure out how do we detect violation? How do we respond to it? When I say we, it, to Chris's point, to Jane's point, it's not just Uncle Sam anymore. It's got to be something broad. And it's also a consortium of countries. So you're stronger if you can do it with others, right? So if the flaming ball of cyber death is coming toward you, you need to take action. You're going to, you know, every country is going to have to take action, obviously. But if you have a chance to build a coalition of other countries and work together, that's a stronger message. It's a less political message. But when you're message. absorbing the fireball of death, right, you can <laughs> so spread let's, the... Let's, put, but let's, let's spend one minute on that. In, the, in our lifetime, in the lifetime of the people in this room, there have been four or five great strategic moments where questions have been put to us. At the end of World War II, the question was, how do we save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime brought untold sorrow and misery to mankind? Not bad, huh? Archibald MacLeish. It's the preamble to the UN Charter. And the answer was NATO. It was the UN. It was a number of institutions that brought governments together collectively. During the Cold War, the strategic question was, how do we save ourselves from nuclear annihilation, the real fireball? Because the only thing standing between us and the precipice is our judgment. And again here, it was institutions and regimes for controlling the conversation or guiding the conversation between governments with these destructive weapons. At the end of the Cold War, the question was, my goodness, look how powerful the United States is. What will the United States do with this power? The answer became, to many around the world, whatever we want. And the question now is, how fragile is the American commitment to democratic values? That's one of the questions. And how fragile are democratic values when we're looking at a highly heterogeneous world that's ever more connected, educated, mobile, and politically engaged than at any time in history? So this normative exercise is not just a walk in the park. It's a deep thinking and, and action agenda to decide what it is we're going to do and who it is we're going to be. Do you want to do questions? That's a hard one to follow up, but I'll give you a try there, Chris. <laughs> I'm not here. I was just saying, do you want to do questions? Yeah, yeah, let's do some yeah. questions. We've got there to, no I wasn't questions. trying to follow up. No, we've got to. <laughs> Wise man. <laughs> um, let's move on to questions. We've got a little bit about 10 minutes left. Um, so we'll try questions. If we don't get any questions, we'll just keep going up here. So. We can talk forever. We haven't done our Boris and Natasha <laughs> imitation. Yeah. So. Squirrel. <laughs> but what a moose and so squirrel. Where, where are the microphones? There's one over here, and there's one over here. Okay, one so this the, gentleman was first. Can you just say your name and... Del Jones, I'm just curious if you think the reluctance to shoot back in cyberspace might be because you don't want to tip your hand in cyberspace. I'm sorry, say that yeah, one more so time. I, I think the was... reluctance to shoot back in cyberspace might be because you don't want to tip your hand on what your capabilities are in cyberspace or where you might already be? Um, there's, there's some truth to that, and there's a sort of a process to go through and make those decisions. And the question that's come up is there's now belief that we could take some actions there's a decision. Do you do it covertly and say, it wasn't me, I have no idea? Do you do it privately and say something bad happens and you go to them and say, gee, I'm really sorry that happened, but you know, when you do interfere in our elections, geez, what can you say? 
there's a there's always a debate there, but it shouldn't be a debate that paralyzes right. you into inaction. It, it's an, op it's an operational question, and I think, you know, yes, you may be uh, using a tool and exposing a tool by doing that, but I but I also think you have to couple it with, for instance, uh, messaging, diplomatic messages, saying it's us that's doing this to you, and stop it, or we're going to do it to you again. But but I also think it goes back to the overstatement of what our capabilities are. And Rob Joyce, who's also I think here somewhere at the conference or, or at DEF CON, uh, in this room. who used to be uh, used to be the White House, had a really interesting way of saying it. And said, you know, people think we have you know, some capabilities. We have the capability to knock someone down, but we don't have the capability to put our knee on their chest and keep them down. And I think. You know, if you're really going to change behavior, you have to think about how all those capabilities play out and what the follow-up is and what the messaging is, which so can't just be the use of the capability. It has to be part of a larger strategy. I had, a, I had an interesting conversation right after Snowden because I know some of the people who uh, build tools for the Department of Defense. And I said to them, geez, this must have been a real setback for you guys. I mean, what, how long is it going to take to recover? And they said, oh, you know, maybe three months. There's just, it's not that hard. So there's a, we might overestimate the, the damage of revealing some. It's more the political side of saying, the political side in the sense of saying, hey, we're on your network, and the fact that the other guy tends to improve his defenses after you do something. But these are all things we ought to be able to calculate. Sir? Hey, I'm a uh, threat intelligence analyst in the private sector, and uh, I've really enjoyed the talk, but um, one of my you know, primary focuses is on China and the way they've um, kind of used and abused the private sector and non-state actors. So how do you handle on an international policy level a, you know, effectively a non-state actor and, you know, how it's being abused by other nation states and, you know, groups like that just because of, you know, the difficulty in attribution and compliance and area in that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I'll start, and I think I'm going to our talk to this too. Yeah. I mean, I, first of all, I think there is this sense that attribution is impossible, and it's not. You know, attribution, may, you may not be able to do it right away, but you look at more than the digital footprints, you look at a lot of other things. And, and of course, countries try to use proxies and cutouts as a way to hide their identity. Uh, but you can often see beyond that, too, by, by looking at, all, again, all the information you have. And, you know, I think we've done that. I think, you know, Mueller's done that also in this indictment. We've seen a, a, examples of that. And that's also where I think some of the private sector reporting well, is helpful. And, and maybe talk just a little bit about the people in the technical community, you know, the saying is like, PCAPs or it didn't happen. You know, packet traces or we well, don't believe you. But so, so, and that's a big problem. Because and a lot of times it's, tell you, it's, is it Team Russia or Team China? You yeah, just, I, I will tell you that I've had this debate with Russian diplomats where they say, we want 100% proof. If it's not 100% proof, then that's not good enough. And there is no standard for attribution in cyberspace. It is a political issue. When the state says someone did it, it's a political decision. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have confidence that that actor is the one who did it, because it turns out it wasn't that actor. That really erodes their credibility in the future. So they take a lot of care before they actually do that. But it still is not a quantum decision. And I used to be a prosecutor uh, where the standard is more than reasonable doubt. That's not absolute proof. And one of the things is, when I was in Los Angeles, if you had a juror who was an out-of-work aerospace engineer, and there were a lot of them, they wanted mathematical proof of guilt. And, and that's not the standard here. So I think you have to work around that and really think about, you know, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's likely a duck. You know, and, and, and what's really interesting about this question, I think, at a, at a strategic level, is governments collectively, all of them, have an interest in understanding what Jim said earlier, the rule of law. Well, the rule of law comes in various flavors, right? There's contested order, there's alternative order, and there's no order. All order is contested. Everybody is in an environment where they're vying for control of that particular order. And sometimes that, that, that contest emerges into alternate order. Uh, we're seeing that a little bit in cyberspace. Should there be sort of completely separate rules from those we know in physical space in whatever, from whatever domain? Um, but we're also seeing lawlessness. I think we are migrating irreversibly away from lawlessness. We may not like where we're going, but as Andy Goodpaster once said to me, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. <laughs> so just quickly on the attribution point, remember that uh, there are uh, multiple means to collect information, and that includes human agents mm -hmm. um, listening to phone conversations, which it turns out we're really good at, along with all the cyber stuff. So when the U.S. says something, it's based on multiple sources. And the, on the, the China question, China's decision on 
how it will interact with the rest of the world is the great strategic problem of our time. And the Chinese now, they have their own internal problems, but they're in this thing of we're moving back to the center of the stage, the world stage. The world should be China-centric. And for them, that means in the norms we're talking about and for the laws we're talking about, they don't always think they need to follow them. They think maybe they need to rewrite them to favor China. This is going to be a long struggle. It won't be a military struggle, but it will be a struggle. And I think there's a non-trivial coda to what Jim just said. The United States is unique among great powers in that it has always been willing to accept the responsibility that goes with its power. And when you look at the other power centers around the world, whether it's in Europe or China or elsewhere around the world, even regionally, that's not always manifest. And so this, when we're talking about shooting back or we're talking about creating norms or we're talking about any of the behaviors that guide or that lead the direction that we might be headed in, it's important, I think, to remember that. It's, if you're keeping score, the film references have been Spider-Man, uh, The Fifth Dimension, was that the one with Bruce Willis, and then uh, Doctor Strange. Fifth Element. Yeah. Fifth Element. Yeah. Yeah. So. If anyone, you know, my Twitter feed, I have a cyber or movie poster a week. I've now done, I'm on number 40 this week, so any suggestions are welcome. <laughs> hey, sir? So do you believe that cyber will remain more of a force multiplier, or do you think there's a real possibility it'll move into... Uh, response of physical in nature. That, I, I that 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 cyber is a force multiplier or, or will... Or do you think there's a possibility that uh, responses from governments will be more physical? Or, or the response of governments will be more physical? I, th- I think we are we're lost if we think the only way to respond to cyber is by cyber, but at the same time we have to have those capabilities. It has to be part of the tool set. Um, yeah, there'll be physical responses. We respond to some of the, phys- the cyber things with things like sanctions and other physical responses. That's, that's the way you do it. You never limit yourself to one channel. You know, a little information in the hands of the eager is a dangerous thing. Um, and, but when you think about what can cyber do, I mean, I, I think at every level it's a, a, a force multiplier. When, when I, you know, I was in the Army, we used to think about that really sort of within the context, the story and narrative about how to fight and win the nation's wars. What we're lacking really is an overarching narrative about cyberspace and the role that it plays in our lives. It's become a utility. We don't like using that word, but it is. Um, And we have really not even begun to sort of frame out the set of issues in anything approaching a prioritized way about how to equitably distribute the advantages of that, safeguard it in ways that we find acceptable, you know, based on our culture and our norms as societies, and then coexist peacefully. I mean, the challenge is huge. Yeah, I'd also say it's a force multiplier in the sense that, yes, it gives you more capabilities. It's also a force multiplier in the way that it also multiplies the vulnerabilities we have and the reliance we have on it. So the trend in the military is to integrate cyber into other operations and look at it for... Uh, what you guys would call mobile uh, radio connectivity, uh, making it part of how you fight wars. The problem we have is that there's a threshold roughly defined on what constitutes uh, a use of force that would justify force in response. Our military is doing good planning on what to do if we get in a shooting war, and the Russians, the Chinese, a couple others are doing it as well. Most of the conflict we're going to see is below that. And so that's where it gets difficult, is what, when it doesn't involve an action that obviously justifies force in response, what do we do back? And to Jane's earlier point and Dr. Strangelove, we, the, the arms control term is we have to populate all the rungs of the escalation ladder. We have to know how to respond. Maybe it won't involve kinetic force. Maybe it will. But most countries are going to try and stay below this threshold of open warfare because it's just... It's just too dangerous for nuclear powers to get in a big fight. You, also have, to, you have to communicate that, too. Okay, I'm going to go to our last question over here on the right. Sir, and then I think you said there's a room. If you want to continue the conversation, we're going to go out this door uh, and coffee. still do. There's certainly a room. There's, uh, <laughs> south side, South Seas H we're going to go to after this. So, last question, sir. Uh, hi, my name's Nico, penetration tester from San Diego. Um, so considering the low barrier to entry uh, for the cyber warfare, um, how do you th- or what type of nation state actors do you think have come to prominence due to the low barrier of entry and how much truth do you think uh, that statement has? 
Well, the traditional top players are obviously, and the DNI has said this every year from like time immemorial, China and Russia is the most capable actors, uh, full spectrum actors, uh, North Korea and Iran raising fast. But the problem is, as you say, there is a little asymmetric uh, nature to this, where countries, and I don't know, I've heard lots of different estimates, how many countries are developing cyber offensive capabilities <laughs> dangerously without any doctrine around them. I mean, the U.S. does have some rules and doctrine around what they do. A lot of other countries are not, and they're, and they're developing them in different ways. So um, it is a challenge, because if you have all these countries developing capabilities, uh, and they can actually cause real damage, then the problem is how do you control that? How do you deal with like proliferation of these, these, action, these uh, capabilities? That's really hard, but part of it is the norms discussion again. If we can create generally accepted worldwide norms that constrain behavior, that's helpful. It's not the whole answer, but that's part of it. So every year since 2011 or 2010, I've been asking the heads of major Western intelligence agencies, do non-state actors have the capability to launch a damaging cyber attack, say of the equivalence of Stuxnet or Aramco? And every year the answer has been no, but within two or three years. Yes, right. So it's a kind of a rolling. They first said that 20 years ago, actually. <laughs> so right now only states have the most damaging capabilities. The things to watch are the rate of change. Are other states good? So Iran has improved markedly over the period when we started watching them. Um, the rate of change and then the diffusion. So far it hasn't diffused to non-state actors and I'm not sure why. Is it that Russians keep their guys on a leash? Is it that Hezbollah doesn't have the capability yet? But so far, it's mainly states. And the question is, will that ever change? You know, I, I think our whole, uh, you know, the way we think about conflict and violence really is in need of close examination. I mean, we call conflict an ethnic conflict as if that tells us why people are killing each other. It doesn't give us any insight whatsoever. The barriers to entry in terms of conflict in the real world are themselves also low. The world is awash in weapons and ammunition. It doesn't take a lot. It takes the intersection of deprivation and discrimination, and you have a population willing to be led to a fight. Now, they're going to riot, but they're not going to engage in a systematic campaign of slaughter unless they are led. And so the conflict of the scale that we should worry about is a phenomenon of leadership. And here, more than ever, we need some. So just really quick, uh, besides North Korea and Iran, yeah, all do you right. see no. We're out of time. Um, thank you very much, and we're going to carry on in the South Seas H. Thank you.